if you have your Bible with you, as you're, as you're getting turned to, to where we're going to be at today in the book of Matthew, chapter 21, I also want to mention, uh, you know, what's going on. I just want to make sure that you don't lose track and everything, you're staying in the loop. You know, some of you will get, uh, you'll get a Christmas bonus. Well, you know, might be good for you and God if you tithe off that Christmas bonus. Or maybe you tithe anyway. You, maybe you want to double tithe off of that or something like that. We have a fund we call the Focus Fund. And here's what we're doing with that. I just need to inform you and let you know. Because every December, we double the regular missionary support that we have going out of this church. So we have a number of missionaries we support every single month. And in December, we double what we give them. So that means this month, that's about $8,000. So we will, we will send $8,000 abroad to all the missionaries uh, that we support. If you want to have a part in that, give to the Focus Fund. Uh, also, tonight, when we get together and we put together supplies for Sunny Point teachers and for uh, you know, families, uh, uh, homeless families, kids homeless families in, in that area. So when we do that, that will probably be three or $4,000 worth of stuff that you will be handling, putting together, and we will take it out and deliver it out there. If you want to have a part in that, then give to the Focus Fund. We'll have our mission, mission Focus 2020 coming up. And uh, that is, I don't know what that is. I don't even know what that is. I bet you we spent 15 grand last year if we spent a penny on Mission Focus, but it is so worth it. We're bringing in five speakers over four days because we want you and your family and your kids especially to get contact with men and women of God who are ministering in other places. You know why? Because your kids ought to be missionaries. And that's part of the problem right there. We allow ourselves to get caught up in everything else that's going on in life, and we forget what it's all about. And so what it's all about is what we're going to look at right here in Matthew chapter 21. I know that you're going to think this kind of out of order. Why are you starting in Matthew 21 and not in Matthew 1? or Luke chapter 2, or someplace like that. And, I, you know, it seems backwards, but I don't think it's really out of order because today I want to take the Bible and lead you in a discovery of something because I think we all, I think we start Christmas in the wrong spot given the mentality we are coming from. And so here's our thesis for today's study. Before we get to the manger and God's gift, we need to know the mission and God's goal. Because sometimes we celebrate something and we forget why it ever started. Oh, Lord. I mean, that's Christmas right there. Uh, so for, because for a lot of people, you know, all the religion they get is the Hallmark Channel. Hello, somebody. So, you know, 60 years ago, there was a movie that won two Oscars. It was entitled The Robe. And it uh, was a story of Roman Tribune Marcellus Gallio. And he was in the Roman province of Judea in the first century, and he was ordered to crucify Jesus of Nazareth. And so after he got Christ on the cross, he sits drunk at the foot, and he wins in, a, in just casting lots, uh, you know, a game of crafts, as it were. He wins the seamless robe of Jesus for his own possession, and his entire life is changed by that robe. I mean, the tables turn overnight. So eventually he returns to Palestine years later to learn whatever he can about that man he executed. But what intrigues me is the idea that a person can be forever changed simply by having indirect contact with Jesus. And because of that indirect contact, you can come into a relationship with Christ through his spirit and begin walking with him together. Last time, we saw the same thing take place. John chapter 12, verse 3. It should be on the back of your handout. John 12, 3. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. And Mary, whose past, as we saw, was both, both poignant and painful, 
embarrassed everybody in attendance. And, you know, some people say they have PTSD and they get overcome with anxiety from trauma that happened to them in the past. Instead, Mary overcomes PTSD from her past by thanksgiving in the present, by doing something for the Lord in the present. You know, how do, we, how do you get the right mindset in yourself, in your family, in your children? How do we escape the kingdom of thingdom and put the kingdom of Christ at the center? How do we do that? Well, you know, for one thing, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, go ahead and don't just buy presents, but buy a Zambia child, right? Do something like that. I mean, another opportunity, I'll just go ahead and mention uh, you know, Mark and Leah Green in our church, and uh, Mark was just diagnosed with uh, aggressive uh, lymphoma, and they have four kids, you know, two boys, seven and six, and a couple of girls, two, and, and a baby. So look, if you get an extra present this year, bring it up to the church, we'll get it to them. Bring it, bring it to the office, we'll get it to them. You know, wh when you're sitting there saying, well, you know, I just got Johnny, his 51st present. Maybe 50 is enough. But wait, I don't want him, you know, I want him to have this one. So I'll take this one, okay? Bring it up to the church. You know, let us, help us take care of needs that we have in our congregation. Somebody else was telling me today, who also is a social worker, could we adopt a particular family for Christmas that has certain needs? They're going to get us the you know, the ages and the genders of the children that are involved. Uh, those are the type of things you need to do in order to bring stability into your life, peace into your life, get rid of the anxiety in your life. You know, because simple fact of the matter, once you start tithing, you can stop worrying about finances, as far as that goes. So tables were turned overnight. And here's Mary. And she lets down her freshly weaved, just left the beauty shop hair. She cracks the seal on a king size bottle of Chanel. And without regard to public perception, private interpretation, or prohibitive cost, she anoints the head and the feet of Jesus and dries them with her own hair. Not a towel, not a napkin. I mean, what woman is ever going to do that? I mean, take her hair. She just sat for a long time in a chair and spent good money. And take her hair and do that with it. So if you're here and you're not asleep, I know just what you're saying. You know, Alan, I don't know who told you I was going to be at Harvest this Sunday, but really that's why I decided to come. Uh, 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 amid the dogged persistence of threats that will not end and conflict that will not quit and problems that will not subside and economic weakness that will not abate, I need my tables to turn. I'm tore up from the floor up this holiday, so I need Jesus to fix me up. I am suffocating with sadness and sorrow right at this time of the year. I am so depressed, I don't know how to get over it. I need a reason to keep living again. So don't let me leave here till you show me. How will this incidental contact with Jesus today turn my tables overnight? I'd be glad to help you out. Let's take this passage, clothe ourselves with this truth, get our healing, head out of here. So, so you'll be ready to lasso somebody to come back with you next Sunday for the, for the junior choir performance, plus a word from the Lord. But today is the theme of joy, and I want you to see what happens when tables turn overnight. Anybody want to hear this? Just say, I'm on board. Alan. Alan. And I'll even take silence as consent because it's just that important. Matthew 21. Uh, Matthew is known as a gospel for the unique moments in the life of Jesus and the triumphal entry into Jerusalem here in chapter 21 was the goal. Now it still is the goal which Jesus will complete at his second coming. But I believe this chapter should lead us into Christmas this year because it is a celebration both of who Jesus was and who he wasn't. 
Watch, verse 1. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied with a, and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them. And straightway he will send them. What do you need for your tables to turn? First off, notice if you will, this is number one. We must be redeemed by God's promises. Why promise? Because you don't have to figure it out. It is not on you to figure it out. And you don't have to figure it out because God is the one who works it out. And that is why we rely on his promises found in his word. They redeem us out of the messy situations we're involved in. So stretch out in faith. Let's move in that direction together. Because Matthew's plain to point out, verse 4, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek, and sitting upon an ass, and the colt, a foal of an ass, not on a horse, which is what kings rode into battle. But this even right here, as a fulfillment of that prophecy back there, defines the nature of Christmas for us. And I want you to notice two things about the promises that promoted him. Why? Because the same thing is true of the promises that push us. First, this is letter A, they are bequeathed by prophecy. So start here today, come all this month, and you'll see what Christmas really means, because 550 years before this, the prophet Zechariah prepared the people of Jerusalem for this visitation right here by saying in Zechariah 9, verse 9, there on your handout, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. This was written into their history, it was embedded into their psyche, it was inscribed on their reflexes, it was baked into their DNA, how their Messiah was going to arrive just like this. And if they accepted him as their Messiah, then verse 10 says, God would cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off. They shall not be threatened by them anymore. Why? Because he, the Messiah, shall speak peace unto the heathen. And this king's dominion shall be from sea even to sea and from the river even to the ends of the earth. And that's a promise that he will yet fulfill to the believing remnant of the Jewish nation though he was rejected by the faithless majority. Friday, I came into work. I usually try and take Friday off, but I came up because Jeff Bartell up in uh, New Philadelphia, Ohio, wanted to do another theology pod podcast. And so I participated three hours. We did the theology pod podcast. Now, I don't think it'll be that long, edited down, but the topic was replacement theology, the idea that the church has replaced the nation of Israel. And I said, you know, that's not really replacement theology, because you can't find it in the Bible. The Bible contradicts it, so it's not really theology. It is replacement ideology for someone to say that. Um, you know, we went, we, just, we went on this trip to Israel, the coolest thing. As we go to the sites, we weave the history in. We're standing up on the Golan Heights, which Israel now owns, uh, ever since the 67 war. Standing up on the Golan Heights, and we're hearing about all the miracles God did. In the 73 war, Syria and Egypt attacked secretly. I mean, they, they had this secret plan, this alliance together. And so October 6, 1973, they both attack. And it looks like it, I mean, the Syrian tanks had gone over the Golan Heights and down to the Sea of Galilee. They wiped out, so Israel exists on the basis of the fact that they have a small permanent army, and that permanent army is tasked with holding the ground for 48 hours until the reserves can be called up. 
Well, I mean, 48 hours was all it took to completely wipe out the tank battalion on the, on the Golan Heights. And so now, 150 Syrian tanks come down over the hill, and there's nothing standing between them and Tel Aviv except six Israeli tanks. And so had they gone on to Tel Aviv, I mean, it's game over. It's checkmate right there. It's, it's, their Jews are driven into sea. It's the, the end of uh, the nation of Israel. And yet, the Syrian tanks pull up and they stop, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait, and finally the reserves come up, and so after the war, the Israeli, Israelis interviewed some of the tank commanders and said, well, you know, why didn't you, why, you know, I mean, you had us. Why did you stop? And they said things like, well, you saw what we saw. And they're like, what, what do you mean? I mean, we have ways of making you talk. And uh, Syrians said, well, if you had seen angels with swords drawn and a hand of fire saying stop, well, you wouldn't have drove through through that either. Now, if that's not why they stopped, nobody knows why it is. God did that for a group of Jews that admittedly, Israel is in the land. That's based on prophecy. But the ones who are there, they are blind to who the Messiah is. And yet, the fulfillment of these prophecies is not on them, it's on God. So that is a promise there in Zechariah 9. He will yet fulfill to the believing remnant. And uh, so now, the branches they wave in Matthew 21, they don't mean a lot to us, but they were not a benign symbol to the Romans. And the promises that promoted him and redeem us are built on prophecy. And second, letter B, they are built also on obedience. Verse 6, and the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them and brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes as a saddle. And they set him him thereon. And none of this would have happened without the two disciples obeying the Lord. You know, I had the chance to witness, and I put a picture up on the slides. Uh, you may, may see it again on one of the slides. I had a chance to witness to a former Israeli general, former general in the Israeli uh, army on the trip last week. And as with many Jews, his stumbling block was the Holocaust. And I tried to tell him, you know, time didn't stop with the Holocaust. Time did not stop with the, fi- he showed me on his phone pictures He was texting back and forth with his other siblings, and they were showing each other pictures of their family that had been killed in the death camps uh, in World War II in Germany. And and, and I said, you know, time didn't stop when when they died, and when they died like that. Jesus is coming again to redeem human history with his kingdom. And Malachi says there will come a day when those people will dance on the ashes of their enemies. Because God is just just like that. Jesus is going to eventually redeem human history. Time did not stop with whatever bad thing happened to you or some member of your family. So ultimately, the bottom line, no matter how you feel or what happened to you in the past, is the propositional truth of Scripture must be obeyed in the present because that is what will free you. Prophecy and promise are what drive the worship-driven life. We'll get back to that topic after the new year. I may even just, we may even talk about how prophecy and worship are tied together. So... So always remember, obedience is better than intent because having a promise does not exempt you from Bible principles. So in the final analysis, this is letter C, the promises are brought in with praise because when Jesus comes riding in that like that, they retched back into their hymn book and they got Psalm number 118 and they started saying in verse 8, Matthew 21, and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And to the casual, uninformed person, it looks like a mere spontaneous election year crowd ready for another stump speech. But to the Roman overseers, it borders on insurrection. And to the Jewish leaders, 
It is promised by being prophesied, which is why in verse 10, it says, when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved. This was not pointless praise because it was informative. It was praise that identified Jesus as Lord to fulfill the Davidic covenant promises of a righteous ruler on the throne. Now watch, I like what John's gospel testifies about this event at this point. If you look at John 12 on your handout, verses 17 and 19, and the people therefore that was with Jesus when he called Lazarus out of the grave they ra and raised him from the dead, they bear record. I mean, they'd already been talking about that. That is the back story to what's happening here in Matthew 21. For this cause, the people also met him. For that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. The critics were there to protest. The crowd was there to promote. But the converted were there to praise. And if that don't beat all, then in verse 20 of John chapter 12, it says, there were certain Greeks among them that came to worship at the feast. And the same came therefore to Philip, which is, was of Bethsaida of Galilee. So he was familiar with Gentiles. So they came to him and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. So Jesus is not just riding a colt, the foal of an ass, but he is riding a wave of princely popularity which threatened to extend to the world. He was surfing a crest of prophetic expectation, even beyond Judea, on top of a borrowed donkey. Jesus keeps moving forward. Back in Matthew 21, verse 11, and the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And, you know, I feel like they are doing the right thing with the wrong motives. And that is part of why the permanent citizenry was asking, well, who is this? And they, the crowd gives four answers. Jesus, prophet from Nazareth in Galilee, Behold, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And why should God's prophet arise in Galilee and not in Jerusalem? I mean, I, I think even his supporters did not know who he was or why he was, because he was more than a prophet come as their king. Uh, calling him son of David was absolutely right, because his roots went far deeper than Nazareth. They went all the way back to Bethlehem. I, so I think we have to acknowledge this, this Advent season. This is our first point for study. Sometimes people worship Jesus not for who he is, but for who they hope he will be for them. And, you know, they celebrate him as if they know who he really is. But I think there's this disconnect between who God is and who we want him to be for us and even more of a disconnect between who we want God to be for us and who we actually need him to be. That brings us to another realiza a realization that explains what is the meaning of Christmas. Because Jesus had to come to die for us before he could come back and reign with us. What they wanted was a Messiah as a military commander to free them from Roman occupation. But what we needed was the Lamb of God to come and take away the sins of the world. And if we can actually understand what's happening here, we will know the meaning of Christmas. So for all those who show up in the next two weeks, to find God for all the wrong reasons, in the midst of that, the Holy Spirit is going to be stirring them to ask, who is this man? And we pray that God will continue revival and that they will come to receive him for who he really is and as Savior to them and Lord of eternity. What do you need for your tables to turn? We need redemption by faith in God's promises. And this is number two, we must be ruled by God's presence. And the reason I love this season and we can take so much advantage of it is because even when God sees all our wrong motivation, he still does not turn away. I mean, just think about that. Even in the midst of a very materialistic, pagan-tinted celebration, God steps in with who he is. I mean, isn't it beautiful? Anybody can come to this church for the wrong reasons and leave with the right ones. I mean, maybe that was you. You know, if you were a girl, 
you came to church to find God. If you were a guy, you went to church to find a girl. I mean, great volleyball, basketball court, and beautiful girls. I mean, Nerf Wars, food, and girls. So you went for Christmas, but you stayed for more, and you went for a children's performance, but you found warmth and friendliness that almost seemed like love. I mean, it almost seemed genuine, like what Jesus came to create, if he created anything in this world. So family manipulation got you here. Your niece, your grandson is in a special performance at church. And the strange, strange thing is, a lot of your friends, family, or neighbors who say no 51 weeks a year will say yes one week. I want to note two things about the presence that prompts us. First, we get God's presence because the Holy Spirit convicts, convinces, uh, convinces, and converts. That's letter A. The Holy Spirit convinces the skeptic, convicts the sinner, and converts the soul. So when you say, hey, I'm going to harvest for Christmas, will you come with me? They feel like your voice is matching the internal conversation the Holy Ghost has already been having with them. And they wonder, is this, is this God? I mean, is this a God thing? Can he be real? That's why we start Advent with this salient chapter. Because Jesus did not come to be glorified in celebration. He went to Jerusalem to be glorified in sacrifice. But you know what? The gift of Christmas, here's the dealio. Gift of Christmas isn't really in a manger, it's on the cross. The gift of Christmas is not really in the manger, it's on the cross. And what this Sunday is a reminder of, and this is our second point for study, is that most of us want to move to the celebration without making the sacrifice. I mean, we, it's natural for us to come and we want to find everything we need and want. But God never just leaves you with the baby Jesus in the manger. He drives you to the Palm Sunday sacrifice. He leads us to that point where the truth must be told. To gain acceptance with God, somebody divine had to pay for your sins. God himself had to become the forgiver and the deliverer and the savior. So that with him you can believe more, you can forgive more, and you can give more. That's why we do this here at Harvest. We let our children lead us in worship and bring us fun and cause us to laugh, and yet it is inescapable. You have to move from the manger to the cross and find God's presence, and this is letter B, because eternal life is in Jesus Christ, and by receiving him into your heart, you're made part of his body to glorify God with us. So this month is a season to reflect where you are with Jesus. Do you just want to worship him when gifts are under your tree? Or are you willing to follow him to the cross and let this time of celebration carry you all the way into his kingdom? Verse 10, and when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? And that is exactly the right question to ask at Christmas. What do you need to do for your tables to turn? We need redemption by God's promise. We need ruling by God's presence. And in the five, this number three, we must be responsive to God's plan. And that means we need to celebrate Jesus' victory before his defeat. His uh, acclamation here in advance of the cross. So today, even though it seems out of order chronologically, today is the day they learn the meaning of Christmas. Because in God, victory always comes before defeat and carries you through it. Amen. So many people come in for counseling and say, you know, Alan, I'm stuck and I'm just stuck right here and I'm so defeated and I'm in so much bondage. And if they're a Christian, you know, the bottom line is you're free. You're just not acting like it. So today, I want you to capture the moment, not be afraid of it. I want you to step into it and enter this Christmas with courage and faith and boldness to bring others to Jesus and to this church. So here, as we wrap up, here is what professional consultants tell us. You can either change the time, change the location, or change the speaker, but only change one of those things. So next Sunday, I will be the speaker but we'll also have our junior choir, uh, you know, doing uh, their musical or parts of it. 
both at 9 o'clock and 1045. But you know what? I know you. You are sophisticated, cultivated. You are such an educated crowd. So the Sunday after that, December 22nd, we're changing both the location and the time. Because we're going to meet in the gym at 10 a.m. In, fa in family service style. So we, we will have preschool but no harvest kids. So they can have, we can have a candlelight service together on the 22nd, right before Christmas. And then the next Sunday, we'll stay in the gym at 10 a.m., but we will have a different speaker because December 29th starts Mission Focus 2020, our missions conference. So we will again have that unified service, but Brian Clark, our missionary pastor in London, is going to preach. And then Sunday night at 5.30 and Monday through Wednesday night, uh, December 30th to January 1st at 6.30 p.m., we will have our conference, special speakers, guest missionaries, and I hope you will see how important it is for you, your family, and your children to have contact with men, the men and women that we are bringing in for you. Because they need to be missionaries in their school. I'm not saying they need to go off as a missionary. Maybe they will. But all of us need to be, you need to be a missionary at your workplace. So it's always a special treat to have us all together in the gym. And this way we get to celebrate both Christmas and New Year together as one family not split between two services. So this will spark faith in what God can do with you and with your kids. So make sure you're here for Mission Focus. Because if you want to create a new world, you've got to choose the right priorities. We're not here for ourselves. We're not even really here for our community. We are here to send, being entrusted with a world big gospel stewardship and the future of the church depends on your informed involvement. It'll be an amazing experience. When we get God on us, our tables get turned because then our lives match the blueprint of heaven and, and what gets accomplished in our life is just like his plan. And I don't know about you, but I can't think of anything more needed in our society than for people to have their tables turned that's why this is such a critical time of the year to use to draw people to Christ because he can do what nobody else can. Every head bowed, every eye closed, every Christian pray. God has chosen us to do something special for him. But you know, that is not true for you if you have not chosen him. God chooses you today, but will you choose him? All you have to do is pray and say, God, save me for Jesus' sake. And you know, the prayer alone doesn't mean anything unless you're going to follow him and walk with him and become his disciple. But if you do that, then it means everything because it brings eternal life. God puts you in Christ and his Holy Spirit in you, and once you get God on you, you find the touch that transforms and the power that protects and the sufficiency that supplies and the favor that fulfills and the anointing that accomplishes and the word that always wins. All you have to do is pray, just pray, Lord, I, I trust Jesus for eternal life. Jesus, I give you my life. And if you're willing to pray that today, will you just raise your hand right now so that I can pray for you? Is there anyone in here today who says, Alan, yeah, I want to pray that today. I want to be able to pray for you. I want to be able to get you some follow-up materials if I can. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. But just raise your hand so I can pray for you. Anyone like that in here today? Anyone else? Go ahead and stand and bump elbows with your neighbor as we get ready to pray and close. Your takeaway for today, next Sunday, weaved into our service, junior choir performance, for the glory of the king. December 22nd, one unified family style service in the gym at 10 o'clock for an early Christmas Eve. December 29th, a unified family style service in the gym at 10 for the start of our Mission Focus Conference, which is how we will celebrate New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. 
and the new year together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your mercies to us. God, every time I pick up or I look at one of those ornaments that we have on the tree out in the lobby that has one of the kids from Zambia, Lord, it just hits me because I'm reminded that many of the children we supported last year, we can't support this year, and reasons are many and varied. They had to drop out to work to support the family. They had to drop out because they got malaria, couldn't continue. They had to drop out because a parent was diagnosed with HIV. I mean, it's just that type of thing. And Lord, it's, it's, it's what we do to reach the least reached and the least cared for. And I thank you we have that opportunity. And Lord, we turn our eyes, not only abroad, but Lord, Lord, we look here. We've got an opportunity. You know, we think would never respond to our invitation to come and hear the gospel, but they will come this time of year. So Father, I pray we'd use that. Lord, give us, yeah, send us out as laborers into your harvest with your anointing and then give us fruit, fruit from doing that as we celebrate this time of year together. We ask it in Jesus' precious and powerful name. Amen.